I'm Douglas Mason, CEO of Naturally Splendid, symbol NSP on the TSX Venture Exchange. Naturally Splendid is a biotechnology and consumer products company focused on the global cannabis and health markets. Naturally Splendid is expanding distribution in this rapidly growing market with products currently in Canada, the USA, South Korea, Germany, and Australia. To view our comprehensive company presentation and for more information, please visit our website at naturallysplendid.com. Welcome to White Rock Podcast. Comments made on White Rock Podcast and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Dr. Bruce Lanfear. He recently spoke in White Rock on heavy metal contamination in drinking water. He's a clinician scientist at the Child and Family Research Institute, BC Children's Hospital, and professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Burnaby Simon Fraser University. His website, littlethingsmatter.ca. Bruce, welcome to the White Rock Podcast. Thank you, Jim. What are some of the most toxic heavy metals you'll find in drinking water? Well, the, the two most common ones are lead and arsenic. Uh, and, and manganese can be a problem as well, but it's also essential. So lead and arsenic are the ones we typically worry about. What are the health risks associated with those uh, particular materials? Some of the common health risks uh, from both lead and, and arsenic are low birth weight, uh, IQ deficits, and cardiovascular disease, uh, including premature death from, from cardiovascular disease or, or coronary heart disease when your heart vessels clog up. Arsenic also is a carcinogen, a potent carcinogen, and so a number of different cancers have been associated from skin, uh, respiratory, and, and kidney cancers. So even if you're washing with water contaminated with it, you can get cancer. Well, dermal exposure uh, isn't a particular concern. It's really when you're ingesting the metals uh, where you where you're particularly vulnerable. What are some of the sources of heavy metal contamination? Well, for lead, we typically think of lead service lines, old lead service lines, or uh, lead solder that was used in uh, in plumbing to connect pipes in the homes. Uh, or could even be in faucets. A lot of old faucets, um, and even some that people continue to use, uh, were made with brass, and brass uh, historically or traditionally uh, used lead as one of its components. And so if you have a um, an acidic water, water that hasn't been adequately treated, um, then it can leach lead from the old lead service lines or the uh, the solder, or the faucets if it's if it's sitting right up against it. And so oftentimes uh, you can get uh, lead uh, that has been sitting in the faucet and it'll high, have high levels. If you flush it and it was from the faucet, then it might go down. The levels might go down. But it was from the lead service lines or from lead solder uh, uh, in the home. It might continue to be high for a little while. Uh, and if it was from the water main, you might flush uh the, the, your water, you know, put it on high flow and just let it flow down the sink. And then, uh, two minutes later, if that, that's where the water has been in contact with the lead water main, then that could be high. So it really depends on what the sources are, but it's, it's primarily from, uh, from the old pipes, uh, and the lead solder that was used. For arsenic, it more, it more often is from bedrock, from the, the, uh, where the water is being taken up in a well. Where are heavy metals stored in the body? Well, both lead and arsenic uh, can accumulate in different organs or tissues from the brain uh, to the liver and other parts. Uh, and then in addition, lead, which um, chemically mimics calcium, uh, is stored predominantly in the bone. But, but they can all be in the soft tissues and organs. And in fact, that's where some of the damage occurs is when they've infiltrated the organs and tissues. Health Canada, the EPA, the WHO, other health authorities are clear that there's really no such thing as a safe level of arsenic or lead in drinking water. What do you think about what's happening in White Rock that has those contaminants in their water? Well, a couple of thoughts. One is um, they've clearly indicated that um, not all these different uh, official organizations have said uh, there is no safe level of lead, but generally that's the consensus across the world. Um, and so that's true for lead. 
for arsenic, there's still questions um, about what levels are, are toxic. Um, certainly, we want to reduce exposure as much as possible for both of them. Um, I think one of the challenges is that we've, we've been operating um, in a risk reduction approach, which is to say uh, until there's evidence of toxicity uh, for exposure to this level or that level of arsenic or lead, uh, we assume that below those levels, it's safe. Now, of course, with lead, uh, that's no longer true, and now we're uh, challenged to try to find how do we reduce the levels of lead in our environment from the water to old paint or dust, soil, uh, when we've so heavily contaminated our environment. It's a challenge. And so uh, we we sort of get stuck in this risk reduction approach where we constantly try to reduce it as much as possible uh, down to the levels where uh, the research has shown it's toxic, um, but not necessarily entirely eliminated from the environment because that's going to be challenging, particularly when we can measure down to extraordinarily low levels. Uh, for arsenic, uh, it was uh, recently reduced from 50 parts per billion down to 10 parts per billion. Uh, there's some new evidence coming out suggesting that there may be effects, particularly in um, uh, for children in the developing brain um, and IQ deficits, uh, as well as some respiratory infections in early childhood, uh, perhaps low birth weight, and even at low levels, uh, an increase in risk of coronary heart disease deaths. So there's certainly quite a bit of, of evidence, and uh, to the extent possible, we should reduce it down as close to zero as possible. With tap level testing showing lead levels that are double the maximum allowable concentration in white rock, would it make sense for people who live in older homes, those built prior to 1990, to see their doctor and get a lead test? Probably not usually uh, a lead test. Um, if, on the other hand, the, the levels of lead in the water are especially high, let's say consistently over 20, um, and if there are young children or pregnant women in the home, uh, then it might be worthwhile to get a blood test. More importantly uh, is to um, reduce the ongoing exposure by using a certified water filter, for example. Um, most of the time, if you, for example, have, um, let's say, a water lead concentration of 10 to 20 parts per billion, that may increase, and you're, and you're chronically ingesting it, chronically exposed to it, that might increase your blood lead level uh, by one, microgram per deciliter, which is certainly not anything anybody wants, but it wouldn't make sense to necessarily get a blood test. Now, on the other hand, if it's a young child, particularly a child who's formula fed with tap water, uh, you would want to consider it. And if, and if the levels are extraordinarily high, uh, let's say consistently over 20, 25, especially over anything over 50, uh, you definitely want to consider a blood test in addition to, more importantly, reducing the ongoing sources of exposure, uh, reducing the lead in the water before you continue to ingest it. So we want to take it seriously, but the key is not necessarily to treat this like a medical problem if it's the exposure, but to reduce the ongoing exposures. We'll have more with Dr. Lampfear coming up. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp, MGI and the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected several high-grade gold intersections, including 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. Additional drill targets on the LH property have been identified by a 2018 drone airborne magnetic survey to further evaluate a pyrotite enriched gold bearing system. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. MGX Minerals is revolutionizing the new energy economy with patented lithium extraction technology replacing traditional solar evaporation using low-cost, low-energy nanofiltration. The first system of this paradigm shift technology is currently being commissioned. MGX Minerals trades on the CSE, symbol XMG, the OTCQB, symbol MGXMF, and Frankfurt, symbol 1MG. For more information, visit our website, mgxminerals.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Dr. Bruce Lantfear. Have you ever seen a situation where a small municipality chooses to uh, use a water source that has known heavy metal contamination and not use another source like Metro Vancouver, uh, where they have water that doesn't have these materials in it? 
what do you think's going on there? Well, I, I imagine it's a financial uh, decision. Uh, there is one other now quite famous example in Flint, Michigan, where to save money they uh, decided not to continue to get water provided by the Detroit Water Authority, but instead began to uh, pipe it in from the Flint River, um, which by itself wouldn't have been a problem, but because they had uh, inadequate staff or perhaps let's let's call it incompetent staff, they didn't use appropriate uh, corrosion control. And because the um, so many of the lead of the water service lines, the pipes in Flint were lead service lines, and they didn't use appropriate corrosion control, it just leached the lead out from those pipes as well as other contaminants. Uh, so there is that example, and uh, certainly you would you would hope that people might learn from that. Um, so a couple examples like that, but I'm not aware of any other ones. Why do you think City Council in White Rock would refuse to test the drinking water for pesticides? Well, I don't know exactly um, why they would refuse to test it for, for pesticides. I think to some extent uh, the guidelines that are out there uh, certainly dictate a lot of what people do. And if they aren't dictating that uh, cities test for pesticides, that could be one reason. Um, there's a lot of other possible contaminants in water. Uh, from perchlorate, uh, to, uh, uh, manganese, which I mentioned earlier. So there's a number of other things we could be testing for. I think one of the, one of the problems is that we've, we've gotten away from this idea that our health is really primarily a function of the environments that we live in, the water we drink, the air we breathe, uh, the food we eat. And we, we, we've come to think of our health as um, a function of having a medical center down the road or seeing your physician every year. Uh, but but in actual fact, the medical centers are there when we've failed, when our environments failed to be healthy. And so I think part of the what, what we're seeing here, and I think people are becoming more and more aware of this, is that if you want to stay healthy, it has more to do with the, the, uh, the food we eat uh, the kind of physical activity we have, whether we smoke or not, whether there's contaminants in our water, whether the air is polluted. But until we make that shift, we're going to continue to uh, become sick from things that are entirely preventable and keep expecting that our medical system can fix that, but it can't. The medical system is there once we've already become sick. It can't prevent us from becoming sick in the first place. And so I think it's going to take a uh, fairly concerted effort, and I think it's going to have to come from the community uh, to, man that, to, to demand that our, our leaders, our political leaders, our health officials uh, begin to take more seriously this growing evidence uh, of the impact of everything from air pollution, uh, contaminants in our water, contaminants in our food, and the uh, uh, resulting disease. What recommendations would you have for the people running to be on White Rock City Council? Well, the, the limited experience I've had uh, with some of the community members uh, it certainly would suggest pay attention to the to the concerns about contamination, uh, metal contamination in drinking water. That would be a big part. I'm sure there's a number of other issues going on in, in White Rock with, with a growing population, a lot of development, but I certainly wouldn't want to ignore the contamination problems with the water. What recommendations would you have for people who live in White Rock and are exposed to high levels of arsenic and lead in their drinking water? Well, the first, of course, is to test them, uh, whether that's working with the municipality or to do it on your own if that's not available. Uh, and if the levels are uh, excessive, uh, to make sure that you have a, a filter that's certified to remove them, and you have to be careful and thoughtful and do some education about that in terms of uh, lead and arsenic. Uh, you can't necessarily just pull a, a Brita filter off the shelf and, and expect that to do the do the work it needs to do. So the main thing is to, to test to make sure that there's a problem, and if there is, uh, take steps to reduce that exposure. We'll have more with Dr. Bruce Lamphere right after this. 
Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp is a Canadian-based mineral exploration project generator. The company currently holds multiple property interests in Ontario with joint venture partners and is seeking further joint venture partners for other drill-ready properties in our portfolio. For more information, please visit our website at rmroyalty.com or call me at 604-922-2030. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Dr. Bruce Lamphere. Doctor, a high percentage of White Rock residents are accessing Metro Vancouver water at the water refilling stations in the grocery stores on the Surrey side of the street. Is that something you would support? Well, I, I think people will take steps uh, to protect themselves and their families. And if um, accessing water that is safe um, is what it takes, yeah, I would probably make sure whether it's putting in water filters or accessing water from other sources that uh, is free of contaminants. I would take those steps. Is White Rock water safe to cook with? There's certainly been a number of, of, of test results I've seen that suggest uh, more needs to be done uh, before we can consider it safe. Um, and and until it's been shown to be safe, I think it really is up to the, to the homeowner, to the occupants, to, to get it tested, to make sure it's tested. And if it does contain high levels of, of uh, metals, that they use filters. Uh, so I think it's until the city uh, finally solves this problem, I think it's up to the homeowners uh, to test it. What kind of uh, challenges could children who are exposed to these heavy metals face? Uh, autism, behavior problems, things like that? So for arsenic and lead in particular, well, let's start with lead because there's a lot known about lead. Uh, lead uh, elevated levels of lead in children's blood has been associated with lower IQ, diminished academic abilities, higher rates of behavior problems like ADHD and conduct disorder, which are acting out type behaviors. Now, those are typically when children's blood levels are um, moderately high, uh, typically over three or five microgram per deciliter, which is 30 to 50 parts per billion. But those cutoffs are clearly arbitrary. What we know is that just incremental increases in blood lead sort of shift children towards having just a little lower IQ or a little bit more problem-type behaviors. For an individual child, they may not always be evident or obvious, uh, but on a population level, we can see uh, children sort of being nudged down towards that place where they aren't going to do as well. And so on a population level, they can have a big impact. Um, for autism, there's some evidence showing also diminished IQ. And both of them, if a um, pregnant woman is exposed, have been associated with lower birth weight and uh, with lead uh, preterm birth. And so both of those, if a if a child is born low birth weight or pre preterm too soon, then uh, that also leads to other types of problems like uh, some respiratory conditions, uh, developmental problems, learning problems, and so on. Knowing the test results for contaminants in White Rock tap water, would you drink it? I would, def I would definitely test it uh, before drinking it, and given the sporadic nature of some of the concerns, I would uh, put in filters, uh, and once those filters are in place, uh, and making sure they're certified, yes, I would drink it. Is city council legally liable for uh, giving people contaminated water? I don't know. It's a it's a good question, but it's a good question for a lawyer. I I couldn't answer that. I don't have the right expertise. Walkerton, Ontario, didn't have heavy metal contaminants. They had an infection problem, and and uh, and that killed people. What if the water in White Rock started to noticeably affect the death rate? Well, one of the challenges, and this is true for uh, many environmental risk factors, whether it's air pollution or heavy metals like lead and arsenic, 
they don't typically, except at very high levels, kill people immediately. Uh, and some infectious diseases will, or, or they develop symptoms that are hard to ignore. So one of the challenges when we've um, begun to shift to chronic diseases like cancer, like low birth weight, like IQ deficits, um, is that the the symptoms or signs aren't necessarily readily apparent until exposures have happened over many years. And so that has made it much more challenging um, to deal with. We've had to uh, have much more um, extensive research carried out over longer years to come to conclusions. Do you think there's anything the residents of White Rock can do to get the city to hook up to Metro Vancouver's water that doesn't have those contaminants? Well, it's it's a good question. I don't have any particular expertise. I think probably many of the community members that I met a few weeks ago uh, have more insight into that question than I do. Uh, but but I do think you know this is um, the type of thing you need to use your vote uh, to make happen what you want to happen. White Rock City Council uh, went to court so they wouldn't have to release the uh, toxic metals report on their water. They don't release the air quality results from their air testing station. They refuse to test for pesticides. What do you think about the state of health? in White Rock if your officials don't want to look for things that are going for, going wrong? Well, I'd say a couple of things. Number one, um, without good surveillance, you can't have good public health. And we look to our municipalities, our, our, our local governments, our city governments, our provincial governments, and our federal government uh, to protect our health. That's one of the primary functions of government. And one of the primary tools of any good public health system is surveillance to know what the problem is, to know what the threats are, whether that's lead and water or air pollution. And if that type of information is not available, then our, our public health systems, our governments are not doing their jobs. Well, oftentimes um, you'll hear that we can't release this data. It's HIPAA protected or it's private information. We don't need to have private information. All we need to know are what are the kinds of exposures that are going on, and ultimately, are those exposures causing adverse health consequences? Now, in Canada, we're still quite challenged. We have guidelines rather than standard requirements for many of the uh, pollutants and toxic chemicals we've been talking about. CIHR, the Canadian Institute of Health Research, doesn't adequately recognize or fund environmental health research like lead and arsenic. So we've got a long ways to go. One of the things I'd point out, though, is that there's considerable interest uh, by the federal government, by scientists, and I think increasingly by the public, that we need to reform the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. And there's some interest in doing so. And I think one of the things that I'd, I'd uh, recommend the citizens of White Rock and anybody else who's concerned about their health is to pay more attention to uh, the modernization of the Canadian Environmental Protection Act uh, to make sure that we have a right to live in a healthy environment, that that's built in to our laws and constitution, that there are standards for the the amount of uh, pollution that we're exposed to to make sure that they're as safe as possible, whether that's pollution in our water, in the air, other chemicals. So we really have an opportunity uh, over the next year or two to dramatically improve our health by focusing on, on the environment, making sure the environment is healthier. The situation on White Rock with the water reminds me so much of the movie Jaws where the city council refused to admit that there was a big white shark out there that could kill people. It's like they don't want to look. And if you don't look, then there's no problem. Right. I think one of the, one of the challenges, uh, for any, for any government, government has two sometimes conflicting goals. The first goal is to protect its citizens. The second goal is to make the citizens feel protected. And sometimes when the problem seems overwhelming, like how, for example, would we bring down air pollution levels? Can you imagine in the seventies, uh, in thinking about how can we bring down the air pollution levels? They're so high. And yet, ultimately, scientists, community members, 
our political leaders, our public health leaders got together and they did it. And air pollution levels have come down dramatically. And so have, so has lead exposure. So we know it's possible. We know we can do it when we bring people together and um, we recognize and acknowledge the threats that face us and how important they are. And there's been, an, over the last two decades, a tremendous amount of research on the impact of pollution and toxic chemicals on our health, and yet we haven't kept up with it. The last time the Canadian Environmental Protection Act was uh, updated was about 20 years ago. Bruce, thank you so much for chatting with us. Uh, how can people find out more about your website, Little Things Matter? Well, the Little Things Matter uh, website is uh, really to profile some of the videos that we've made available. And they can go to www.littlethingsmatter.ca. That's without any spaces. Bruce, thank you so much for being on the show. You're very welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. My guest has been Dr. Bruce Lamp here. He recently spoke in White Rock on heavy metal contamination in drinking water. He's a clinician scientist at the Child and Family Research Institute at BC Children's Hospital and a professor at the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on White Rock Podcast and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. White Rock Podcast is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.